Yes, so I'm delighted to be joined by Jeffrey Kane, who is a journalist, is author of The Perfect Police State, which examines the, the, the Chinese state's treatment of, of the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities. Um, I mean, predictions are up to a million being held in, in re-education camps. Um, I mean, almost certainly the biggest human rights abuse currently ongoing. I say, so it's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. I say, it's, it's a truly astonishing and terrifying book. Um, with, with huge implications for, for AI and for I mean, the future of human governance. But I mean, just to start specifically with the Uyghurs, I mean, when did you first become aware that there was something, something was going wrong, something weird was happening? Well, I actually, I, I always knew that the Uyghurs were an oppressed people. I had spent many years in Asia. Um, I've been based in Asia and the Middle East since 2008. Uh, and you know, back then there were there was repression of the Uyghurs. This was a well-known group that had run into uh, major problems with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but it wasn't until later I, I had been following the situation there uh, for many, uh, um, just many years, and I knew that things were bad. Um, but it wasn't until advances in uh, certain new technologies, novel uh, technologies such as artificial intelligence and facial recognition. Uh, voice recognition, there was a new wave of neural networks, um, which is a type of uh, machine learning AI that had been developed in the early and mid 2000s um, that had started to take hold among authoritarian governments. It just so happened that um, China, a country which loves both authoritarian rule and new technologies, uh, was the first to adapt a lot of these technologies, this AI, and to, um, you know, to, de to deploy them against their people. So I had been a technology journalist um, for many years, and you know, there were a lot of journalists who were also looking at this, but I don't think many were actually tracking both the, the actual tech developments and the political developments together. Usually it was uh, one or the other. So uh, I had been in this unique position where, you know, I was, I, I was, you know, I was fusing them. I was, you know, asking, asking questions and, and meeting people, including government officials, you know, in different countries uh, who were, you know, were also deeply concerned about some of the developments in China and what it could mean for the future um, of how we govern technology and how we use it. Um, you know, is we, there were many questions. This was about five years ago, um, questions over whether, uh, what China is doing would be exported to much of the world. Would this uh, software, you know, would it make it to the shores of the West or would it get as far as Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, there were many questions, but the most alarming development came um, in December 2017 for me when I made my most recent trip to Xinjiang, China, this region where the Uyghurs live, um, to a town called Kashgar, which is the historical heartland of the Uyghurs. This is where they um, came from originally. This is, you know, this is this is their home, uh, and it was simply a dystopian um, battlefield, a post-apocalyptic. It looked like a nuclear war had come in there, uh, you know, decades ago, and this was a society that was just stuck in this post-apocalyptic, um, you know, slave state to these technologies that the Chinese government uh, had mastered. There were government cameras everywhere, covering pretty much every square meter. Um, back then, in 2017, the government was getting close to surveilling the whole region, and now um, the government claims that they, they can see every square meter, so they've you know, made strong developments there. Um, and then on top of that, uh, all of the, this, this data that was being gathered from people's smartphones and their apps, their purchases, their clicks, um, from you know, the surveillance cameras, from just what they do, uh, you know, do they walk in the front door at the end of the day? Do they walk in the back door? Do they, um, you know, go to the grocery store at 8 a.m. or do they go at 8 p.m.? All these uh, data points were being mass gathered into a system called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform or the IJOP, which is this massive artificial intelligence dragnet, um, this all-seeing eye that informs the police when someone might commit a crime in the future. Yeah. Um, when someone needs to be surveilled more and maybe brought to a concentration camp for brainwashing. So this is straight out of a, a sci-fi novel. Um, you know, the one that I think is most relevant is Minority Report, which is by Philip K. Dick, made into the movie with Tom Cruise about 20 years ago. Uh, it, it's a movie about um, these, these beings, these humanoid beings called precogs who can uh, see murders that are going to happen in the future. Uh, and then, you know, they send in the special forces teams to, you know, to detain and arrest and to brainwash people before they've even committed the crime. Um, and this is what's happening in Xinjiang right now. And that's what is so 
terrifying about this place that it really is the modern embodiment of uh, the dystopian novel of say the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you mentioned your book, obviously, 1984. Um, I mean, it, it, it's all, all, all those fears coming into being. I mean, when you speak to, so it's obviously you've been speaking to um, lots, you know, lots of Uyghurs who've been affected by this and, and some of whom have managed to get out. And I, I know some of them are still facing threats even outside China. Um, I mean, did they ever see this coming? I mean, clearly, as you say, they were persecuted people, but I mean, were they shocked by the extent of what happened? You know, they were shocked. Um, you know, I have, I've interviewed dozens of these refugees, um, and even in the past when it was possible, I, I spoke with Uyghurs who actually live in Xinjiang. You can't do that anymore. It's just the, the region is locked down. But um, there was always a feeling that, uh, yes, the situation there was pretty bad. Um, you know, there were arbitrary detentions and torture. Um, you know, there were also protests that broke out in response. Uh, people, The people of Xinjiang uh, wanted to share in the fruits of the Chinese economic miracle that's happened you know, since the end of the Cold War. They felt that they were being left out. They live in poverty. There are young men joining terrorist groups who are, you know, just upset about all this. Um, and uh, there was always a feeling that, yes, it was bad, but it, it, it can't get much worse because the Uyghurs were one of the most oppressed people in China already. And, you know, the question is, well, what, what can the Chinese Communist Party roll out that they aren't doing already? They're already surveilling with human police officers. They were, there were cameras set up already. Um, I'm, I'm speaking 10 years ago. But, you know, then the big question is, you know, I guess I would be one, looking back on those times, I think one of the big um, pitfalls was that nobody really had the imagination to, um, to envision what could happen. You know, it's, it's as if, there were these uh, major technological shifts happening underneath our feet with, um, you know, smartphone technology 10 years ago, social media, um, the AI, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, you know, click, the, the, the clickbait kind of economy that was emerging, um, predictive policing, you know, these were all emerging technologies 10 years ago, but nobody um, really looked at it and said like, hey, look at, you know, look at how bad this can get, look at how this can be used. Um, I think that that was always relegated to the, as I've said before, the, um, you know, the realm of science fiction, you know, it was always relegated to the, the world of, of fiction and the novel and, you know, people with big imaginations who maybe their ideas are too flighty for what's happening in real life. Um, and I think what's happening in Xinjiang just goes to show that when we are dealing with uh, technology, when we're deciding how to govern it, um, you know, we should actually start with the, the extreme assumption, we should assume that um, you know things can get bad. That whatever we can imagine today is not going to suffice to you know to to understand uh, what's going to happen in the future. So we should start on the assumption that you know th like things can get bad. They can also get good. I mean, there it could go either way. Um, and then build our governments around you know the, the checks and balances on this technology based on just how um, malevolent you know our societies can get. And one thing I, I never quite understood, I mean, obviously, this, this you know, the treatment of the Uyghurs has done huge um, damage to China's reputation across the West. I mean, you know, parliaments across the West have accused them of genocide. Um, what, what was it about the security situation that made them so nervous that they felt this was necessary? I mean, obviously, you know, between sort of um, 2010 and 2014, there, there was, it was kind of periodic terrorist attacks, but they, they seemed relatively low scale. I mean, what, what, what was it that happened that made the Chinese state become so fearful of, of the situation? Well, um, yes, there, there was a series of terrorist attacks in China. This was uh, around the years 2013 and 14. There, there was a spike. Um, it was never a major, this, you know, this is not Afghanistan or Syria or Turkey even. We're not talking about a Middle Eastern um, you know, civil war barren country, but um, China was concerned about the, you know, the, um, the people, the, the, the groups in Afghanistan and uh, also in Syria who had hosted Uyghurs to, to train them to be terrorists, spilling back over um, into the Chinese border. And so um, I think that um, to answer the question, one of the things that we should start with is, you know, just uh, driving home, you know, how intense um, the Chinese Communist Party how intensively and seriously uh, they take their security. Um, and, you know, what I mean is that, so in, in the West, we might, you know, set up uh, airport che uh, checkpoints and, and 
and there's the the scanning machine that scans you as you go through. I mean, those have been criticized for violating civil liberties and maybe being yeah. rolled out a bit too much. But the Chinese equivalent to that would be, um, you know, like installing one of those uh, those machines at like you know the entry point of every single uh, market or or every single school, elementary school, uh, you know, it, it's the, the Chinese system of, of dealing with security is um, a paranoid dragnet. It's simply, um, you know, the, the, the mindset is that we want to take, uh, you know, we, we want to take what's been done, what, you know, what has been developed in technology, and we want to apply it to create a total security state where we can know everything that's going on about everyone at all times. Um, if we have any questions, you know, what Mr. Smith was doing, at 3.01 p.m. on Tuesday, well, there's a camera somewhere somewhere that's caught him and we, we could literally just type it into a computer and using our facial recognition, we can figure out where he was at 3.01 p.m. just to be sure that you know he's not holding terrorist thoughts. It's simply a, um, it's a historical and political and, and cultural um, uh, pathway that China has taken under the Communist Party and, you know, China, um, even before the Communist Party, it, it had a long history of authoritarian rule by emperors, um, you know, who they, 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 there's just there's just simply not a, a tradition of, of democracy uh, in China. And that's what we're seeing today, the extension, the 21st century extension um, of what the Chinese Communist Party has done in the past 70 years, clamping down on its people and curtailing their civil liberties. I mean, it's it, it's terrifying when you see some of the, I mean, I mean, some of the things that basically see people um, deemed to be extremists. So obviously, you know, having a relative abroad, um, I mean, you know, visiting religious sites. It seems. I mean, do you think the common do you think the Chinese Communist Party is, is trying to is trying to demolish Islam within within the country? Basically, it is it's trying to um, mean there's no Muslim population at all. Or, or are they happy for there to be a Muslim population, but only if it's very carefully controlled? Um, so. Um, there's some historical background to that. So it used to be that um, the government of China um, had a system, a, a political system set up in which they tolerated um, the presence of different ethnic groups and tolerated to some extent um, the presence of religion. Even though religions were formally banned, uh, the Communist Party knew that they couldn't eradicate Islam uh, you know, 30 years ago. It was simply going to be there. Uh, and so there was a tacit understanding of, you know, don't, um, you know, don't, don't stand out in the street and you know pray and, and be too extreme. But as long as you practice your religion within the confines um, of what the government allows, then you'll generally be okay. And even in Xinjiang, um, at all the major mosques, there were imams or Islamic leaders who were appointed um, by government committees, you know, to run the mosques, to, to oversee the the um, the prayers and to you know oversee the community. And you know, there there's obviously an element there of the imam is working for the government. So of course, you know, they're gonna be watching you and just, you know, if there's anything going on, they'll, they'll report you to the government. Um, that, that's a, it's, it's just a security measure that China had uh, created. But um, there, so starting about uh, nine years ago when uh, the current president of China, Xi Jinping um, became, you know, he, he became the president or, or you know, as the, the correct translation would actually be the chairman of the People's Republic of China. but. The Chinese government uses the term president uh, just to make him sound more legitimate in the eyes of the West and English. Uh, <laughs> so we can call him chairman or president or whatever you want. But um, so starting about nine years ago, uh, there was an ideological shift that began um, under his presidency and under the people who he sort of consolidated as, as his people, his, his ideologues, so to speak. Um, China went from being a relatively, uh, you know, a diverse country with, you know, the, it officially has 54 ethnic groups on paper. There are so many more, all these languages being spoken um, in which all these, you know, these ethnic groups had been set up on a hierarchy where the Han Chinese, the dominant group was at the top, um, you know, and then at the bottom would be the, the Tibetans and the, the Uyghurs and the, the more distant groups from the Chinese um, center. But now that ideology has changed, this is reflected in Communist Party journals. I mean, intellectuals are publishing about this and the new ideology that has won out um, is the idea that the nation uh, should be Han Chinese, that, that the Han Chinese uh, way, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, it's perfect here. Okay, um, so the, um, so, so the the current uh, that you could say the dominant ideology among the Chinese government is that you know we are a Han Chinese nation, um, and even though we have all these ethnic groups that have you know historically been um, to some extent a part of our empire or our great nation state, 
uh, the time has come um, to consolidate you know, the nation under, under Han Chinese-ness. So uh, this is part of what's happening to the Uyghurs. You know, this is the, uh, say, you know, an attempt to erase their identity and their culture and, to, uh, and their language and to, you know, make them speak the Mandarin Chinese language only to, you know, to raise kids to only speak the language to, you know, starting with the current, the younger generation to raise them under, uh, you know, Han Chinese practices of eating pork, which, you know, Uyghur Muslims would not do. Um, it, it's just essentially that that's that's the big idea behind this that um, that that these Uyghurs are being uh, consolidated or you could say um, transformed into uh, Han Chinese people and it's it's I guess the Western equivalent would be um, you know if uh, you know in, in Eastern European country somewhere decided to uh, you know go after uh, you know Jews or, or Roma people and, and to you know to force them to abandon their practices and to simply become uh, Polish or German. Um, so you, you know where I'm going with this, that yeah. this has happened before. Uh, you know, this is not something that simply exists in, in China in, in 2021, but this this has, um, it reminisces of, of fascism and Nazi Germany. Um, I think it is fair, you know, to compare China today to, you know, what Hitler had been creating in the early 1930s. I mean, there is no, Holocaust costs. There, there are no death camps yet. You know, there. It, there this is not a place where um, we'll find mass graves at the moment. But um, it does worry me because I do think that um, you know pe people often say be careful making comparisons to Nazi Germany because you know Nazi Germany is such an extreme example. That's that's what kids use when they want to smear their opponents. Um, but when you actually look objectively and, and pick apart and analyze, you know, what's been happening in China in the past 10 years with its ultra nationalism, it does have some very fascistic um, tendencies that are worrying. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the combination obviously of cultural erasure, but also of, um, of targeting populations, so birth control, forced contraception. Um, I, I mean, do you think it'd be fair to call it a genocide? Uh, yes, it is a genocide. Um, I think that it is a fair label. I think that the U.S. State Department was correct to label it a genocide. Uh, I think that the parliaments that have uh, favored the word genocide, that, that uh, I, so the exact language that they used when they passed these motions was that um, they do see it as a genocide, but the, the, the governments of these countries, the prime ministers, they have not, uh, you know, actually gone out there and started calling it a genocide yet. Yeah. But um, it is a genocide. And, um, I think that a lot of the world has uh, trouble grasping, you know, how it can be a genocide and, you know, how a genocide can happen in the year 2021. Um, I, you know, when we, when we use the word genocide, we think of, um, you know, like what I said before, death camps and, and concentration camps and gas chambers. Um, you know, we, we really think of the Khmer Rouge and Rwanda and we think of, uh, of the Nazis and all the, the horrors of the 20th century. That's the image that comes up. But we live in a new age now. Uh, we live in a new age of, of you know, technology that allows for governments to very subtly and as quietly as possible exterminate a population through the use of forced contraceptions, uh, contraceptives, or um, you know, through the, the assimilation of a people to another culture, the very slow assimilation. Um, under international law, one of the pillars of a genocide is in fact the forced sterilization of the, popula of the population to a race of people. Um, one of the, the, the so the one of the trickiest questions that we get to in declaring a genocide is the question of intent. Um, I do think that from the Chinese government's own statements on what it's doing, um, I do think that there is an intent to commit um, genocide. Uh, other scholars, you know, scholars of international law are having this debate and, you know, there are people who disagree with that. There are others who agree. Um, I think the threshold has been met. And, um, you know, I do think that, um, you know, th this is a genocide. One of the big tragedies, though, is that uh, the Chinese government is not uh, a member of the International Criminal Court. And so it's unlikely that any of its leaders will ever ever be tried for the atrocities happening there. So um, that is something, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that the Chinese government's going to join the ICC anytime soon, but I, I do think that the authorities there, you know, unlike Rwanda, unlike, um, you know, what happened at Srebrenica uh, in the Balkans with the massacre, the leaders of China, unlike them, are, are shielded from any kind of legal repercussion for what they're doing. I mean, as you mentioned, China has lots of minority groups, um, some of which are um, considered problematic by the government. So, I mean, the Tibetans would be another example. 
Um, even though they're ethnically the same, the people of Hong Kong, who obviously kind of rose up in, in 2019. I mean, do you think there's any risk that what's been done against the Uyghurs and, and other Muslim minorities could be extended against other groups deemed problematic in China? They could be almost like a model to be rolled out. Oh, it's already happening. Um, you know, it's already been happening over the past two or three years. The Xinjiang model was only the starting point. Um, and what's been happening in Xinjiang to the Uyghurs has now also been happening to the Tibetans with the uh, the forced assimilations of a culture. Um, these, these surveillance technologies, including social credit, have been deployed all over the country. Um, I think the, the, the main difference is that Xinjiang has concentration camps for the Uyghurs, whereas you know, around the country, not every group is being put into actual concentration camps. Um, but that's not to rule out that that won't happen. I think that there's a good chance that it will happen. Um, we should also note, though, you know, it's important to just to remember that um, these surveillance technologies made by China are being exported with the encouragement of the government to, you know, just around the world to other countries. They tend to be authoritarian or somewhat authoritarian countries. Um, you know, lots of nations in Central Asia. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of, of Latin America and South America, Eastern Europe, um, have embraced what companies such as Huawei are doing with the stated goal that they've stated very clearly um, that they are going to use it to, you know, to manage the political affairs of the country, that they're going to surveil the population. Um, there was one case in Uganda, I believe it was, uh, in which uh, it, it turned out that um, the authorities there were using Huawei technology to spy on opposition figures. These these sorts of scandals have happened in other countries too, involving Chinese technologies. Um, so it is worrisome. And even you know, just a few days ago, even in the UK, there was um, an announcement by the government uh, that it was it it does plan to roll out a form of the social credit system um, that would monitor people with the goal of getting them healthy, that they would be rewarded for eating better and staying fit and exercising. Uh, and then they wouldn't get those rewards, you know, say if they didn't lose weight or if they, they stayed how they are. So obviously that's that's not as extreme as what's happening in China, but it's, it's worrisome um, because these are fundamentally the same technologies that China uses to surveil its people and to give them social credit scores, a trustworthiness ranking for the government on whether or not, you know, they should trust you or not. Yeah. I mean, one thing I hadn't completely appreciated until I, until I read your book was the extent to which China's big technology companies are kind of linked to, integrated with the state. Uh, and, and obviously, very recently, China's been cracking down on some of its big tech companies. I, I know it's all sorts of interesting arguments as to why exactly they're doing that. As you say, there's, there's lots of debates about um, these things being integrated into the West. So something like Huawei, I mean, w w would you say that having that in your 5G system is just um, is a national security risk? I think it is. Um, I think there are ways to mitigate the national security risk, but um, you know, 5G, Huawei's 5G system, it does have uh, legitimate uses, but the bottom line is that it is a national security risk. Um, and to understand this risk, um, I, I think that we can even go back in history and look at some parallels. So one of the defining um, strategies of, you know, of victorious or prosperous nations um, you know, in, in the history of technology are those that uh, have control over the communication systems. So um, in World War I, one of the reasons that uh, Britain had such an upper hand uh, you know, against uh, the Germans wasn't, you know, it wasn't just, um, you know, it wasn't just the, the Straits and, and the fact that it was an island and it was a little more isolated from Europe, but it was that uh, German communications um, almost exclusively went through Britain, the, uh, the undersea cables, you know, and then to the rest of the world. So Britain had an enormous strength in being able, you know, its companies um, could work in British interests and could monitor, uh, you know, German communications as they were coming in and out. You know, no level of encryption would be able to defend against, you know, a nation or national companies that simply want to snoop on you if, you know, if they want. Um, and that's what's happening now uh, with 5G. I think that people tend to forget these historical lessons. Um, and, you know, regardless of whatever, you know, whatever security measures we use or whatever uh, system of encryption we use to try to protect against, you know, a, a Huawei 5G system, the bottom line is that Huawei is in fact, um, you know, required to help the government in certain circumstances. There are laws in China that require it. There's a national security law, a national intelligence law, that both make companies, including Huawei, um, you know, extremely vulnerable to government intervention. Um, they must work with the government a lot of the time. 
um, Huawei denies this. And just, just to be clear, like Huawei has a stance that, you know, we, we don't work with the government. You know, we only work under certain certain circumstances. You know, don't worry, it's you're, you're going to be secure. But the facts and also the context don't support um, that position. So if Huawei did, you know, if the government did say, uh, you know, tap that, you know, tap that communications line, let's spy on this person through the 5G network, uh, there would in fact be a lot that Huawei can and might be required to do to send back to the Chinese Communist Party, regardless of whatever, whatever it says in public, and also regardless of whatever we do to protect ourselves through encryption or a VPN, it doesn't really matter in the end if Huawei controls our data network. There's obviously a debate across the West about um, the decline of liberal democracy. Um, I mean, do you think that emerging technologies are making it easy to maintain a dictatorship? Yes, I think they are. I think one of the biggest dangers of AI in particular is that um, artificial intelligence is a, it, it is an ultra centralizing technology. Um, just the nature of it, that it can uh, build on its own learning and continue to learn without human intervention uh, means that, you know, the person who controls the intellectual property and has the kill switch um, would have enormous power, you know, if they could control uh, a system of artificial intelligence that would be smarter than anything we've seen yet. Uh, but even beyond, you know, AI is more of the frontier. That's, that's a technology that we've made enormous progress on, but we still haven't gotten to um, the holy grail of general AI that would be able to learn anything. I think that we're far away from that. But um, even looking at the, the track record so far, the, the just the, I mean, you know, we, we live in an age in which um, billionaires are going to, into to space, uh, you know, while the rest of the planet is dealing with climate change and other disasters, you know, brought on um, by some of the system that we live in. Uh, you know, just the fact that, um, you know, Jeff Bezos and other these these technology titans, these barons, um, you know, have the resources to be able to, you know, do what uh, national governments do with all their tax money and, and just everything, you know, it, you know, all the technology that was once controlled by the government during the Cold War now is in the hands of of a handful of private people who can essentially do what they want with it. Um, I think that we've realized that technology is a massively centralizing force. Um, and, you know, we're at risk of, you know, that, that centralization of power continuing if there's no way to, to govern and to monitor how they use the technology. So, you know, I don't think, I, I mean, I'm not saying that we're, we're not going to live under a Jeff Bezos uh, dictatorship anytime <laughs> soon. I don't think he has that much power. But um, the, the concern is that, um, you know, can a company get so powerful with this technology one day that it will simply rival a democratic government and be able to um, even control or influence that government in ways that we haven't seen yet? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I suppose one kind of interesting way of looking at it is that, um, I mean, it's obviously terrifying what's already happening with, with existing technology. Um, but as AI starts to match and surpass human abilities in more and more areas, I mean, as a species, we've never had to compete with an intelligence remotely compared to our own. Um, you know, I mean, the, the most intelligent animals in the world, dolphins or, or chimpanzees, are, are still way, way below our level. Um, I suppose it's kind of an interesting question as to what would have happened if the, if the Neanderthal was survived. Um, but if, if we end up with AI, which surpasses humans in, in more and more areas, I mean, do you think a liberal democracy can be maintained? I mean, would a liberal democracy become an inefficient, an inefficient form of government in, in that it reacts to things much slower than this great increasingly powerful computers? So, you know, this is something that um, so many philosophers and, um, you know, thinkers, political scientists, um, just so many great minds around the world have been trying to ask these, <laughs> to, to answer these questions. And, you know, I've thought about this. I've done a lot of reading, um, you know, gone to so many conferences and spoken to these people. And, you know, I, I can't even, uh, you know, get to the answer yet over, you know, can we get control over a super intelligence that's vastly, you know, that's simply beyond anything that humanity can, can even accomplish, uh, you know, on its own. Um, so, you know, I guess the optimistic view would be that, you know, maybe a super intelligence would, would be so intelligent um, that it would see our human flaws and that it would learn to, to care for us and to help us create a better world and to, um, you know, to, to make just, just to make a, you know, maybe it could make a utopia if it really is that, um, you know, that super intelligent. I mean, maybe it would see its long term interests and say, well, you know, if I want to survive, you know, I depend on this planet too, and these humans depend on me. And there's a, there's an ecosystem here, and maybe you know maybe we 
maybe that should be the future. But you know, that's uh, that could be wishful thinking. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, like that. That is very optimistic. Um, you know, the the track record, at least, of humans and other humans. You know, human civilizations that are far more advanced uh, do tend to exterminate those that are less advanced. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's human nature or just the circumstances of the, of the time they were living in. Um, but, uh, you know, my biggest fear is that, um, you know, we will, we will create a super intelligence or a, a general artificial intelligence, as it's called, um, that would be able to, you know, get control over humanity. Um, now, this is, yeah. you know, I, I think this is far away. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the promises in AI um, in recent years that it would be able to solve so many of our problems have been overblown. And in, 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 in reality, um, AI tends to work in highly specialized, uh, you know, hi highly specialized fields that don't require too much context. Um, you know, AI tends not to do well with context, uh, and uh, it, it tends to work better in, say, you know, look, say, like a specialized field such as uh, looking at X-rays, radiology. You know, it, AI is good at that. Um, AI is good at, uh, you know, running the the vacuum, the little vacuum that goes across the floor and, and sweeps off your dust. Um, you know, these are fields, you know, it's like AI can learn a lot about what it's doing when it's hyper focused on one of those areas and it can find correlations that humans can't see. Um, but we still haven't really solved that mystery of the mind and how, you know, how humans are able to jump between tasks and, you know, to do certain things consciously and others unconsciously. Um, you know, I think that we're finding that, you know, we can't simply replicate the brain or the mind, um, you know, in a, in a, computer format yet. Um, you know, I, I don't know when that's going to happen. I guess I'm not, I'm not enough of a technologist, um, you know, to be able to kind of plot out what we're headed towards, but there have been some advances in quantum computing that might change some of that. Um, but who knows? I mean, you know, we, there are still so many mysteries of the mind that we just don't totally understand um, how it works that it's, you know, how can we begin to, you know, to apply the way that we think the, the neural net, uh, you know, to a computer system that, you know, that that can really only just play play Go or play chess or read X-rays. You know, how how do we make that jump to that big general, you know, the the overseeing super intelligence that you know would supposedly control us all? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a bit of a tangent, but I, I've been doing some work on the transhumanist movement recently, um, and it, obviously these are a lot of the, the questions they're dealing with. One of the arguments I've heard from them, which I, I find very interesting and, and sort of troubling at the same time, is, is the argument that um, as a species, we're getting technology, we're going to get technology, not obviously transhumanists want to augment human capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so fit around with our biology, basically. That as a species, we're going to get technology so advanced and so powerful that our kind of primitive minds that have been you know, formed by evolution and small tribes, et cetera, et cetera, um, can't really hang it. In, in the same way, if you give a monkey a hand grenade, at some point it's going to pull the pin. You know, even if it doesn't, um, and, and their therefore their argument is that you have to alter human biology. But I, I know, um, I know, I'm going way off on a tangent on this. No, it's fascinating, and I, I I've studied this to transhumanism, so we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I mean, let's, let's do it briefly. Um, so as I say, obviously, the, the argument is that um, humans are the products, obviously, of, of an evolutionary process, which is incredibly brutal. Uh, we've evolved to live in a world which is very different to the one we currently do live in. Um, the world we live in combined with our very primitive, you know, the, the technology we're going to have combined with our very primitive brains um, sets on a course of disaster unless we do something to alter our biology, essentially. I mean, what, what, what do you think of that argument? I mean, I, I kind of think that I, um, a lot of the transhumanist stuff, a lot of these questions are obviously going to become much more bigger and more pronounced as we go forward. Um, and, 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 you know, questions about how are we going to combine human with humans with AI, which matches us past our capabilities, could become some of the most important disabilities of this century? Yeah. So, um, so here's my take on transhumanism. So, you know, there, there's always been that that um, that polar debate between the the Luddites who say that we should um, erase technology, go back to the old, you know, the old times. No, no electric. You know, back back in the 19th century, they said electricity is uh, destroying us, the, the railways are destroying our civilization, we're becoming corrupt and decadent. Um, and the Quakers you know, would go back to the, to the old days and say, we're gonna have a, a horse and carriage and live off the land. Uh, that's one extreme end. And then there are the, um, you know, the, the transhumanists and the technophiles who say that we need to um, leap into the future, that we need to embrace these technologies and do everything we can to get ahead. And there's an element of hyper-competition in it because I think that um, encoded in their arguments 
like what they're really saying is that if you don't hop on the train now, you're going to be left behind and I'm going to become a superhuman. Yeah. Um, so there's an element of Darwin there that's um, unsettling. Um, and I think that that's that kind of thinking, you know, that we need to simply race forward and embrace. Um, I think that it's uh, potentially destructive. And, you know, I think that the patterns, or at least the stories of humanity have shown over and over again, that when you, you know, when you embrace something without thinking carefully about it, um, you know, you might reap the benefits, but there are going to be, you know, the population at large is going to have to deal with so much fallout. And, um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, what's the term? There, there's a formal term that economists use. The uh, the, uh, the the third party, uh, whatever it is, I can't remember right now. But um, <laughs> um, but um, so my view on transhumanism is that you know I, I think that it's inevitable that um, you know humans will augment themselves at some point, and in a sense, we already augment ourselves with um, you know with pills. Like if you want to concentrate, you take. Ritalin, and you know, I, I don't take any of these pills. I don't, I don't need them in particular. But there are people out there who, before the exam, they take a Ritalin, and then they they're hyper concentrated, and they claim it helps them. Um, so you know, there are lots of moral questions about that. I'm not the kind of person who believes that you should simply do what you want. And you know, uh, you know, I, I guess I don't believe in like that that liberal view, like just the individual does what they want, and you know, the market will sort it out in the end. Um, we, we do have to ask a lot of questions over, you know, who controls the technology that, you know, where that that is augmenting us. So, you know, it, so Elon Musk is already talking about Neuralink, this, you know, chip implant he's going to sell to us and put in our brains to make us hyper intelligent and we'll be able to communicate with devices from our, you know, from our minds and all that sort of thing. Okay, so um, if Elon Musk controls that technology, uh, I would definitely, I would not trust it. I would, I would, you know, I would not put the, you know, I would not put my brain's health um, in the hands of an individual like Elon Musk, um, whose business model depends on, you know, going on Twitter and, uh, you know, hyping up certain uh, Bitcoins to make their price go up. I mean, that's not the sign of a reliable person who's going to be looking out for your uh, best interests. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, what does that mean? I, we're going to be sitting here one day and, you know, in our, we're going to see before our eyes flashing is going to be an Elon Musk tweet, you know, because we have this chip in our head that's like sending Elon Musk tweets, tweets at us. I mean, I'm just kind of joking around and, and giving a hypothetical, but, um, you know, the, the, so the, the, the problem I'm getting to is that, um, you know, we need to have a stronger system set up that tells us, you know, that, that lays the, fe the, the groundwork for, you know, who actually controls the technology um, and how do we govern it? And where is the line drawn? Where do we, you know, set the limit? Um, you know, I, I don't think that Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos should simply be able to command their companies to give us a chip to put in our brains. You know, I, yeah. I think that there would be a, a process, um, a debate that would happen over years or even decades over, you know, what it means that we're doing this and how can it help us? And who is it going to help? You know, is this only going to help the rich at the expense of the poor? Is it going to make us a more divided society? Um, you know, like who, who benefits, who loses? Uh, and only once those questions are answered, uh, you know, then we can go forward with the transhumanist, you know, ideas. Um, but I'm not totally optimistic about that because I think that our technologies are already far ahead of um, our, our social systems. You know, we're, we're still catching up to just the pace of change um, you know, in the 21st century, it's been so fast yeah. and we're still catching up to, yeah, like we're, we're catching up and still figuring out how to, you know, control social media, disinformation, um, you know, all these things, smartphone addiction, all these things that are in front of us, um, we still can't figure out what to do with them. And so I'm not optimistic that, you know, when the, when the transhumanist augmentations come out, we're going to, you know, be ready and we're going to have, you know, those questions answered. You know, I think that there, it's more likely that there will be a crisis of some kind and then we're going to say oh no um we we have to look at this and we have to figure out what we're doing with this technology yeah i mean do you think this is a slightly more general question but it, i mean it kind of relates to i mean francis fukuyama i know wrote a, a, an article i think it was about in 2000 in which he argued transhumanism is the world's most dangerous ideology um it's sort of a, a, i mean the, the, the general um, thesis i think was that um you can't maintain a democracy if you have huge displays um a, a dramatic increase in the kind of the difference in ability levels and intelligence. I mean, do you think the vows over technology and the power of technology are going to become some of the most kind of 
politically sensitive and explosive subjects of this century. In, in, in the same way that, say, I think, I'm not obviously social class would still exist, but in the same way that, say, rows about ethnicity or social class dominated the 20th century. Um, yeah, I think that it will. I think that it, it, that's already happening. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we, we're facing issues such as uh, climate change and um, wealth inequalities and, you know, racial issues, police brutality, uh, you know, all these topics for the 21st century, they, they have been the subjects of the 21st century. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I, I think that we're already seeing technology being tacked onto that. Like we used to assume that technology would solve the problems, but now we're realizing that technology is one of those problems <laughs> that we actually need to solve. So it's, uh, it's like the opposite happened. I think we were caught um, caught, we were caught uh, blindsided by, you know, technological advances. Um, but I, I do think that these technologies, they can be good, put to good use, but it's just, um, you know, we, we just need a better system for ensuring that a handful of people don't control them because they're not going to use these technologies in, in the interest of democracy and society at large in that case. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, there was something else. So, um, yeah, I, I also think that um, there are, you know, we've been seeing some fundamental shifts happen recently and how our society is structured and how we think about things. So like capitalism, for example, um, there, this is, this is going off a little bit. This is not technology, but yeah, it's there was, okay. Well, there was a really fascinating um, shareholder activist campaign at Exxon Mobil recently. Exxon um, is one of the most regressive, you know, anti-environmental uh, com you know, oil companies that exists where, you know, every other major oil company has pledged to reduce emissions, but internally ExxonMobil, um, you know, internally without telling anyone, you know, had these predictions that they were actually going to raise their, uh, their emissions, you know, over the next five, 10 years, it came out in the news. Um, and uh, there was a, a fascinating um, a, a hedge fund that, um, it just opened up, you know, one month and then the next month it was challenging ExxonMobil um, in its stock, uh, you know, running a shareholder campaign against it to force it to install board members who would lower, you know, the um, low, lower, you know, like force them to lower their carbon emissions or to predict that in the future. Um, and for the first time, this was truly historic. I mean, I follow these, these uh, campaigns a lot. For the first time, <coughs> this, um, this small hedge fund um, which didn't have a lot of money, managed to convince all the major institutional shareholders and pension funds that own ExxonMobil uh, to, um, to, to back it and to support board members who would um, put in environmentally friendly practices. Now, in the past, this sort of campaign would lead to losses. It just simply wasn't profitable. But as a result of this environmental campaign, um, ExxonMobil lost to the shareholders and their stock uh, skyrocketed. Their stock just started going up. Their stock had been low for a long time. Um, and what that shows is that we're actually seeing a shift uh, in the, the the capitalist system that exists, you know, in which like somehow we've managed to find a reconciliation, you know, between um, the environment, which was always, uh, you know, a, a loser in terms of profit for companies. Uh, now it's, you know, now it's making money. And, uh, you know, the views of shareholders and investors who actually want better environmental practices now. Like, it, it really is a shift, I think. I mean, one of the, 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 I mean, I'll tell you, sorry slightly change the subject again, but one of the very um, troubling things about, about the Uyghur persecution is the, the amount of international support China's managed to drum up. Um, so I, I know, obviously, a lot of countries are, are quite economically linked to it, but particularly African and Asian countries, particularly Muslim countries, which was slightly counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, I mean... How troubling is this? I mean, the fact that China can get so many countries, especially developing countries, to kind of, you know, repeat its arguments. Yeah, um, so it is troubling. I think that um, many Muslim uh, Middle Eastern governments uh, have been enormously hypocritical in, you know, in refusing to condemn, you know, what's happening to the Uyghurs in China. Um, you know, and then in the meantime, they, I, I think that these governments so it says my connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I, I hear you perfectly, yeah. Okay, okay. I keep getting a little sign that says my connection's not good, but I guess it's working yeah. okay. Um, it's, it's, it seems to be working at this end. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So here, so one of, okay, so one of the big hypocritical, um, I, I guess the, the hypocrisy of this is that, um, 
these these Muslim Middle Eastern governments, um, which tend to be authoritarian, will not condemn China for its treatment of the Muslim Uyghurs and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz people. Um, but you know they will condemn Israel. Uh, you know they will condemn uh, Europe and America for their involvement in you know the Middle East or Israel for you know what how it behaves in the Palestinian territories. Um, and so I think, you know, th there are a couple of factors here. You know, the, the biggest one obviously is, is Chinese money um, that China has been running its Belt and Road Initiative and the implicit understanding, you know, since China is an authoritarian regime, it's here's, here's a bunch of money, don't criticize uh, China. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't really exist in the West as much that, you know, Western nations give aid freely and governments criticize them, but that's not a condition to the aid or the invest or the, the loans that they're getting. Um, the other factor is, you know, I think that this has not been looked at as much, um, but China doesn't really fit into the narrative of the Middle East that well. I mean, the, you know, the, the last major um, engagement of China in the Middle East was the Silk Roads. It was when, you know, the, the Tang Dynasty of hundreds of years ago, the Qing Dynasty, these dynasties, these emperors, um, you know, were sending their, their people, their, they were sending their generals and they were sending their explorers out across the Middle East through the Silk Roads. They're traders, um, and that was a time of great prosperity. So, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that the average uh, person, you know, sitting in the Middle East thinks like, oh, China. I remember the Silk Roads. You know, I think that's more of a historical, um, a historical story that you know maybe some people, some people think about. Um, but ultimately, I think that it's that China does not really fit into the the narrative of the Middle East that easily. You know, it's it's easier to condemn Israel, um, but when you look at China, it's like, well. You know what what has china done uh lately like what i you know it's like it's just kind of a distant country that doesn't really affect their everyday life yeah i mean just just one final question um i mean i'd say I mean, what, what clearly what's happening to Uyghurs is, is utterly terrifying I and mean, what, what in terms of practical steps to, to to help or to put pressure on china what can actually be done oh, okay i'm in an interview oh, sorry sorry about that um so um so what were you, so what was that question? Sorry, sorry. Um, I mean, what practical steps can Western countries actually take to, um, to, to help the Uyghurs or, or indeed any other group that gets persecuted by a, a, a similar authoritarian future, um, a similar authoritarian regime in the future? So um, I think that uh, Western governments need to strengthen their sanctions, uh, targeted sanctions at specific um, individuals and companies in China that are, that are directly involved in these human rights abuses. Um, there's still a lot more that can be done. I think that people assume that China is heavily sanctioned, but um, there are so many bad actors in China who are, you know, they, they have account, they have open free accounts, um, you know, in, in America, in, in Europe, um, also in places like the British Virgin Island, which is a major, um, you know, hub for, uh, for Chinese money laundering. The, the BVI is actually one of the biggest um, Chinese destinations for dirty money. Um, there's also, you know, Bitcoin. And what's interesting is that the Chinese Communist Party is also concerned about money laundering. Uh, and that's because there are so many elites there who have amassed so much wealth in the past, you know, few decades that are hiding their money overseas. They want that money too. They want to tax it. You know, they want to bring it back in. It benefits them. Um, and, you know, I think that there, there will be an ironic uh, convergence of interests, um, you know, where in the West, you know, it's like, you know, we, we want to stop laundering too. We're concerned about human rights. Um, you know, China is not concerned about human rights, but they want to stop laundering. And I think there's actually an interesting potential for those interests to converge. And, and we might actually see stronger efforts from both China and the West to, to stop some of this. Yeah. I say, Jeffrey, it's been a fascinating and terrifying conversation. Um, I say, I, I've got your book here. I'll, I'll put a link in the description to where people can buy it from. Um, I say, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, all, all the best of your work. Thanks for having me, James. Great to talk.